The webinar, so the title of the webinar that you see on the first slide is how to get started at CSES, an introduction to the CSES user lab, a webinar for the CSES user community. My name is Luca Marcella. I work as service manager at CSES, and uh, I would like to introduce you to the user lab main uh, system that is Pitstein today. Although there will be, let's say, development in the near future that will be uh, actually disclosed in the uh, next webinar about proposal submission. So let me outline here the presentation that we will see today. We will start with the policies and resources, so the login on the system, the file systems that we have available, then go to the development environment with the features of the hybrid system and the programming environment. I will briefly outline how to submit jobs and monitor your job submissions to show you this learn workload manager and the best practices of your submission scripts. Finally, we will close with the documentation and troubleshooting tips. So in particular, how to submit a support request. Now, during the presentation, I will go through the slides. So in case you have questions, I suggest to wait until uh, the end of the slides where we will give you time to raise your hand and ask live the questions. You can also use the chat to write down questions, but I might go through that only after the presentation. So let's start with the policies and resources. The general policies <clears throat> are outlined in two main pages that we have available on uh, the CSCS main web page. The first is the code of conduct that outlines the proper practices. So the access to source codes, you need to agree to make codes available for support. So this is automatically assumed when you accept to have your account at CSCS. Scientific advisory committee, the committee members must not be contacted. So these are the people that are actually providing uh, an advice to the director for the allocations and the acknowledgements. Acknowledgements, you must acknowledge the use of CSCS resources in all publications related to your production, setting a reference to your project ID. So instead of the, <clears throat> the, the, the hashes here, you put your project ID in the, in the acknowledgements in your paper. Second part, the user regulations that define the basic guidelines for users. You must remember that username, so accounts, are personal and sharing is forbidden. Data ownership, access to and use of data of other accounts without prior consent from the principal investigator is prohibited. So the principal investigator is the main contact person for each account, each project and multiple members must uh, agree with this uh, code of conduct and user regulations. And then I put a link <clears throat> to the ETH Zurich acceptable use policy for telematics resources that is available as PDF online. Access to CSS resources may be revoked to users that are violating this policy. So please read them carefully. Data retention policies at CSS. So we have data backup for active projects. Uh, data in the uh, users and project file systems. These are your uh, home folder and the project and the folder of your project is backed up. The past 90 days are covered. Data recovery is also possible on these file systems that are GPFS file system with the so-called daily snapshots for the only for the past seven days. You can autonomously recover this data and the link here to data recovery will point you to the user portal with the procedure to recover the past seven days. And if you want to go back in time until the past 90 days, you need to ask beyond the seven days. Data in project folders, it is immediately removed. Uh, it is removed after the three months, immediately after the th three months after the end of the project, it will be removed. So what happens as soon as your project expires? The data backup is disabled immediately. 
and no data recovery is possible any, any longer. Keep into account as well, keep into account as well that there is no backup for the data in Scratch. So the Scratch file system is meant for running jobs and uh, immediately getting the output that should be moved uh, elsewhere. So there is no recovery in case of accidental data loss if you delete by accident any file or folder. And there is also no recovery of data that is being deleted due to the cleaning policy that is active on the Scratch file system. That, <clears throat> that is uh, explained in a few slides later. Fair usage policies. So I mentioned the workload manager that is Slurm on our systems. The job scheduler is a shared resource by itself. So it is used by all the users on the system that submit jobs. So you are not supposed to submit large number of jobs and Slurm commands all at the same time because this will cause an overload on the Slurm uh, scheduler. We will therefore be forced to kill jobs if they violate this policy and limit new submissions in case you submit a very large amount of jobs all of, of a sudden and if you are overloading the, the scheduler. We, we, you will be informed, but please keep in mind that this is not uh, in, uh, in line with the fair usage policies. Login nodes are also a shared resource. So running applications on login nodes is not allowed because login nodes are used by all users to access the systems, compile their applications. So if you overload the login nodes, I, either from the CPU point of view of them or the memory, you are blocking basically a shared resource and you may harm the access to other users to the system. You should submit your simulations with a Slurm scheduler using the compute nodes of the system. So heavy processes that are running on login nodes or long processes that are running for a long time on the login nodes will be terminated. You can check the summary of all the policies that I mentioned under the user portal, accessing the, <clears throat> the link that is at the, below, uh, at the bottom of this page. Now let's see how to access the systems. You should already have an account at CSCS. The procedure to get an account can be found on the CSCS.ch main website linked by the top link here. The front end system called ELA is accessible via SSH as ELA.CSCS.ch. The command is the one on the right side that you can type on your prompt if you use a Linux system or a Linux emulator. The front-end system only provides a minimal Linux environment. So you can SSH directly from the front-end system to the computing system. For instance, you can access Spitzdient with sshdient.cscs.ch from the front-end system. Or you can start, for instance, an external data transfer <coughs> using uh, Globus Online, formerly Grid FTP, from and to CSCS systems. Now, please note that no programming environment is available on the front-end system. And the user scratch space is also not directly accessible from the front-end system. So the front-end system is mainly just a gateway to the computing systems. Now, since we are talking about accessing the systems, I would like to remind you about multi-factor authentication. CSCS users will be required gradually to authenticate using multi-factor authentication that we uh, use, uh, we use the acronym MFA to, to, <coughs> to, um, um, to reduce the, the length of the, of the wording. So MFA is implemented gradually in the sense that uh, batches of users are contacted from time to time in a scheduled base in order to provide uh, their credential in a multi-factor fashion. So you will receive an email once it is your turn, and you will find the information about the procedure in the email and in a link to the user portal. The idea is that this is a two-factor authentication for the moment. So one factor in order to authenticate yourself 
will still be your user login name and the password. So this is referred as the thing you know. A second factor is referred to as the thing you have. So a one-time password that you obtain on a separate, on a different device with respect to the device that you use to connect to CSCS systems. At the moment, CSCS supports authenticators that follow the uh, TOTP open standard. For instance, you will, you will find uh, anyway instructions once it is your time in order to activate the multi-factor authentication, but we, we do suggest, for instance, Google Authenticator, which is available on, on mobile devices, for instance. The multi-factor authentication applies to both web-based services. So for instance, if you access uh, by web uh, your uh, account uh, space at CSCS, and also applies to the SSH connections to systems. For the SSH connection to systems, you cannot use any longer a private key, but you need to generate a certified SSH key. You will be given a script to do that, and the generated key will have a limited validity in time. All this information, in a way, is just to give you, uh, let's say, a, <clears throat> a, an anticipation of what might come in case you don't have yet been asked to join the multi-factor authentication at CSCS. Let's go next to the file systems that we have available at CSCS. So here I list all file systems, although the focus today for the user lab is Pitsdine. On the top of the table, you see the different file systems, and we start with the scratch of Pitsdine. And then in the list, you can see which is the type of the file system, the quota, if any, and the expiration validity of the da data stored on the file system. If data backup is active or not, access speed, fast, slow, medium, and then the capacity, which applies to all users. So not directly to you, but it gives you an idea of the size that you have available. So the scratch of Pits 9 is a last file system, and there is a soft quota that is active on the, on the system that is uh, uh, only monitoring the number of files for the moment. And uh, it limits that to 1 million. Soft means that if you uh, you can pass the quota, it's not hard, but then it, you will be prevented from submitting new jobs. So the idea is that in order to prevent an excessive load on the scratch file system, the last file system, we need to limit the amount of files. We also need <clears throat> to limit the space, every, as we will see in the next slide. But for the moment, the quota only of course, at the level of, uh, of the number of files. We have other scratch file systems, not directly related to Pitstein, but they, are, they have a similar, uh, similar scope. And most important thing to remember is that there is an expiration date of the data on scratch that is set to 30 days. It means that data that is older than 30 days will be removed by a script running periodically. You, we have other file systems on the right side of the table, users, project, store. So for most of the approved projects, only users and project are relevant. Store is a, on, by contract only. So in typically users is your home and you have a limit of 50 gigabytes per user or and 500,000 files. And you can keep your username until the account closure. And as I mentioned, in, in the previous slides, there is data backup for the past 90 days. Project has similar uh, limitations, but the limit in the files is 50,000 per terabyte of, uh, of storage. And also here, the data is backup for the past six and uh, 90 days. Um, <clears throat> please keep in mind that these uh, file systems are not meant to start your jobs. You should start your jobs from scratch because the access speed that is listed in the table clearly states fast for scratch, slow and medium for project. So please use scratch. I think I will mention that in the next slide. In fact, for scratch file system, as I said, this is a fast workspace that is its main purpose is running jobs. So it is designed for performance, then reliability, 
I mentioned the cleaning policies. So cleaning policies, files older than 30 days are deleted. The script that does that runs daily. In order to make the script effective, you are forbidden to use commands like touch in order to change the timestamp of the file. And there is no backup on the Scratch file system. So you should keep in mind that you need to transfer the data back to another storage location after your job is completed. In order to keep the performance of the Pitstein Scratch file system, we have implemented the soft quota <clears throat> on inodes. Inodes means files, also folders, but okay, you are more affected by files typically because you use sometimes a lot of files. And uh, we need to take also an eye to keep an eye on the occupancy of the so the disk space used on Scratch because the last file system uh, might have performance issues when it gets filled up. So if uh, the occupancy of the total amount of data goes beyond the 60% of the available space, we will ask you to remove unnecessary data immediately. If this doesn't help, and unfortunately we reach the 80% of the total space occupied, unfortunately we will have to free up this space manually removing data without any further notice. So you will lose your data. So it is always better in case we contact you to remove the unnecessary data immediately unless you risk to remove data. I mentioned that because in the past months we have been recording, contacting some top users in terms of this space in order to reduce the amount of data. And this is important to keep the usage performing for all other users. In order to access the Scratch file system, we provide a an environment variable that is dollar scratch on pit stint and points to scratch sonexion three thousand dollar user your username so it, it is convenient if you want to access that immediately instead of remembering the full path next are the users and project file systems that are shared parallel file systems based on the ibm gpfs software they are accessible from the login nodes with a native gpfs client on pit stint they are meant to store your data sets, your code, your configuration scripts, for if you want to compile your code, for instance. And they are better performing with larger files, so larger file sizes. So if you want to achieve a better performance, you should archive the small files with the utility. As I mentioned, you are not supposed to run jobs starting from users or project. The emphasis in these file systems is for reliability. They are backed up and not performance. The directories, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the beginning, are backed up up to 90 days, and they have the snapshots for the past seven days that you can uh, recover by yourself. There is no cleaning policy until the three months after the end of your project. At that point, everything will be deleted. So please recover your data in time. We have also environment variables that are pointing to the personal folders. Dollar home points to your slash users slash dollar user space. And dollar project typically points to your project, to your primary project space that is slash project slash your group ID, your project ID, and then dollar user. About computing resources. So I mentioned computing nodes compute nodes. So computing time on Cray systems, and Pit Stint is a Cray system, is accounted in node hours. The resources here are assigned on a three months windows. So on three months windows, the quotas of the three months windows are reset then on April 1st, July 1st, October 1st, and January 1st. You should use thoroughly the quarterly compute budget within this time frame, the three months, the three months window, because unused resources in this allocation period of three months cannot be recovered. This is needed to ensure a, a, an on-time use of the resources of a, the allocation year. So you should check your budget frequently in the current allocation window in order to make sure that you're using that ideally on a, a, in a linear way in time. So proportionally with the time of the three months window. In order to check your budget, we provide different tools. On the system, you have a group usage tool, a command that is called accounting. 
this comment, you, you can type it on the login node of PitSigned and it will report what is the group usage of the groups that you're a member of across the file systems for the quotas and the disk space occupied and also the computing systems. So the how much of your budget or your computing budget have you used in the different projects where you are belonging. Then you have also a web-based tool that is the account and resources tool that you can access at account.cscs.ch. This is the link that I pasted here. And uh, <clears throat> you have also uh, the instructions on how to use the web-based account and resources tool on the user portal on, on a dedicated page. So let's then switch to the development environment on Pitstein. As I mentioned, as I mentioned, Pitstein is a Cray system. It's uh, partially made by XC50, Cray XC50 nodes. These are hybrid nodes with an Intel processor, Haswell processor, and NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPUs, one per node, and a, a smaller size a smaller um, part of the system is made by XC40 compute nodes. So these are nodes featuring Intel Broadwell processors, two per node. Um, the login nodes are also uh, mentioned before as a shared resource. You can see they have a large amount of memory, 256 gigabytes, because they are meant for building your applications not for running as i mentioned in the past in the past slides the interconnect the connection between the different compute nodes is based on eris routing and communication with a dragonfly network topology the scratch capacity the scratch file system that i mentioned in the past slides features 8.8 .8 petabytes of space one uh, thing to mention the file systems the project file system is mounted read only on the compute nodes. So you cannot run a simulation that would like to write on project nodes because the output would be empty. And, they, and again, as I said at the beginning, this is meant for performance reasons. You should use a scratch to run your jobs and then transfer the data afterwards, not start your job from users or project for performance. One important thing to mention on the hybrid system is the NVIDIA CUDA toolkit. At the moment, we have version 11 on the system. So you can find a, a comprehensive development environment to build your GPU accelerated application. We have a programming environment that is programmed NVIDIA on the system with NVIDIA uh, compiler and optimized libraries <clears throat> and also debugging and performance tools. In order to learn more, you can either have a look at the um, documentation on the system, or you can also have a look at the NVIDIA developer portal that provides a lot of information how to build and run your applications built with the NVIDIA on the NVIDIA GPUs. The system features the Cray Linux environment as a, uh, operate, an operating system. Currently, we are, we are at version 7.0 update 03. This is the standard operating system on Cray systems, and this is based on SUSE Linux Enterprise Server version 15. So the current release that we have on the system has been installed last year in February. You can find more information in case you are interested and documentation on the HPE Support Center. As you know, Cray is part of HP. You can search there for uh, extensive documentation on the different uh, parts of the Cray Linux environment. I mentioned programming environment. So programming environment is <clears throat> the Cray programming environment features a lot of modules that allow you to prepare your code before running jobs. The CSCS systems use the modules framework. So this is a framework to manage applications and library by adding the path to your library path and your and your and your local path in order to find uh, executables. You can check the currently loaded modules with module list. When you enter typically a login, when you access a module load, typically the default environment on Pit Stein is a featuring program Cray already preloaded with some other modules. For instance, the default architecture is the XC50, the Intel Haswell with GPU, and the module Cray PE Haswell reflects that. 
and you can use the common module array anyway to browse all the other modules available so modules list module list mentioned above gives you the list of currently loaded module array gives you the list of all possible modules that you can load you need to adjust your target architecture before building your application so if you do that <clears throat> with the modules that we provide they will automatically load the the depending module so the, the int gpu is a module that we provide that targets the xc50 as well with gpu the int mc targets the xc40 so the multi-core intel broadwell these modules will update your module path they will therefore make the kp haswell or kp broadwell module available already loaded and they will also make available applications that we have provided in the software stack that are built to run on the gpu or on the multi-core nodes so this is an example of how to set your programming environment. You can switch with a module switch command from the default programming environment, Cray, to the GNU programming environment, for instance, program GNU as listed on the top line on the screen. You can load the Dane GPU module to prepare the GPU environment. And then if you type module list, you will see that the Dane GPU module provides the Cray P Haswell module, so the, the one that is uh, targeting the uh, Haswell compute nodes with GPUs, and you have many more uh, modules that, are, that have been loaded, both for compiling, like GCC, that is the compiler for the GNU programming environment, the LibSci, which is the uh, scientific set of libraries provided by Cray, the MPI library, Cray and Peach, and so on and so forth. The Cray XC programming environment at the moment is is at version 21.09 on the system. So this includes what is called CDT, Create Developer Toolkit version 21.09. There are also non-default programming environments that can be accessed with other CDT modules, but please don't do that unless required by CSCS staff because some modules have been provided for specific reasons. So they may, they might be present for specific application workflows or of specific uh, users the cray compiler environment is at the core of the cray programming environment for for the cray uh, programming environment this is the cc module the cray compiler that uh, also comes with uh, the cray mpi the cray libsci as i mentioned a, a set of libraries that are necessary to run on scientific applications so we also provide Cray performance measurement and analysis tools, in particular Perf Tools version 2109. And uh, other uh, items of the Cray programming environment are the environment setup and compiling support, Cray PE module, which provides also the modules framework 3.2.11.4, and third party products for other programming environments. For example, I mentioned for program GNU, the GCC compiler. The latest versions available are 1030 and 1120. Cray Python for Python development, only version 3 of Python is supported, and Cray R. On top of that, we provide some applications for some scientific applications already on Pit Stein. Once you load either the Dane GPU module or the Dane MC, if you type module level, you will see additional modules that you can load. For instance, here I put the mostly used applications that are in material science, biological science, visualization, <clears throat> with a version that is currently default. For some of them, we have more recent versions like Quantum Espresso 7.1 or, <coughs> or LAMS version of uh, uh, September 22 that are not yet default, but you can load after uh, inserting directly the version in the module load command. For more information, you can turn to the user portal at the link that I provide below. Now, about job submission and monitoring. So, as I mentioned, the Slurm Workload Manager is the uh, submission system that we have on the on CSS machines that allows you to run on compute nodes with specific settings. The main command to submit a, a script as, uh, to run on compute nodes is called sbatch. So you need to prepare a script, like the example here, job.sh, that should start with the bin bash. And then there are, there are some uh, Slum directives that start with sbatch, the sbatch keywords, that 
will specify some options of your job. For instance, number of nodes, time, uh, which partition, that is in this case normal, this is the default. So if you, even if you don't set it, it will be taken as default. And the constraint, so GPU or multi-core. That depends on your project, of course. If your project is allowed on GPU, you should run on GPU only. And then you run the command with the uh, Slurm command that is called srun. srun will ensure that your command will run on the compute node. And the right side, it will show it will show you it shows you how to submit as batch and then job .sh. This is the way to to run on a compute node. If you want to have a template for your Slurm script, please use the Slurm job script generator that is available on the user portal and provides some options that you can set online. On the system, you have also the manual page of SBAS in order to check possible options. Now, the Slurm queues on Pitstein are different and you can set them on the command line with the partition option. We have a debug queue, maximum 30 minutes, as a quick turnaround to test jobs, maximum one job per user. We have a large queue for large scale job, but only by arrangement. So you need to contact us before and you cannot really submit immediately just today for that. There is a long queue for specific long workflows, but the standard queue is the normal queue that has a maximum time limit of 24 hours and maximum number of nodes, 2400 for the GPU, 512 for the multi-core. We have also a low queue that allows the usage of allocation above the, the limit, but just in case uh, there is really space on the system, because otherwise it's a low priority. So you really cannot count to use it, for instance, at the end of an allocation period when many users want to, to complete their, um, their, their budget. And then pre-post is for pre and post processing on the multi-core. And XFAIR is the queue for transferring data, data transfer queue, between different file systems. For instance, you have some data on the project, you can submit a job to transfer that on Scratch, then run on Scratch, and then transfer back. And the transfer queue does not get uh, charged on your budget, so you should use it in order to transfer. If you have a lot of data to transfer, for instance, and you can also set dependencies, you can see more information on the queues at the link at the bottom. Now, you can check the jobs that are in the queue using some Slurm commands. The main command is SQ. Please use SQ with dash U option. Dash U is the option to select the user. So if you use dash U dollar user, it selects your jobs. And you can also have the, you can also use the S info command, which is more complex. It can give you more options to see other, uh, other queues as well. Both commands can be checked also with the man pages to see the additional options. Now, job priority can be also checked. So jobs have a priority in order to run. There are There is a complex algorithm to set the priority based on the first share, based on the previous jobs, based on your current usage during the allocation period, a lot of different factors. You can check the priority with a common S-PRIO, S-P-R-I-O. And the reason why your job is pending is usually shown already by the SQ command, like pending because priority, pending because of resources, the resources not yet available, so on and so forth. Uh, sorry, here there is a mistake. The SQ check command is the accounting command. I, I'm sorry for the mistake. I will correct that in the PDF that I will circulate after the. I will make it available after the um, after the presentation. Now, as I mentioned before, the, the command is the accounting command for the for check you, checking your budget to check it, the the computing hours left. And you might, from time to time, need to check that there are uh, activities, maintenance activities going on in the system. We usually inform you with a mailing list if you are a member. Of the community, you receive certainly the, the, the mailing list of CSCS, the, the, the mails from the mailing list where you are, are informed about active uh, interventions on the system. In this case, there will be reservations on the system, so it will prevent you from running. And the reservations can be visualized with S control show reservations. Now, what are the good practices when you submit a job? 
first of all, specify an accurate wall time. So if you need 30 minutes, do not submit a job with 24 hours time limit, because the longer you submit a job for, the longer in general you need to wait to have the allocation set. So it's better to, to actually measure the time that you need in advance. And then you should run on Scratch. So in the script, go to Scratch, to the Scratch space of your username and then submit the, the, the script. And then if you have uh, many job steps, like multiple S runs in a single job, then we provide a tool called Greasy that is a high throughput scheduler to pack single uh, run, single uh, node, single task jobs in a single allocation to make it more efficient. And then make sure that your command, your S run commands work. <clears throat> so you can test them before with a small allocation in the debug queue. You can put some uh, sleep statements be between uh, different S run tasks in order to avoid uh, uh, having uh, a non-working script. So what you shouldn't do when you submit jobs. So submitting a script with a loop is not a good idea because mistakes might happen and you might not have that under control, especially when you have job with thousands of steps. As I said, this is not allowed. So having a large number of jobs submitted also with multiple steps, uh, it's uh, impacting the Slum scheduler. So please try to submit dependencies instead, for instance, to run jobs after one and one after another. And then don't run from home because this will impact the performance of the home file system that affects all users on the loading nodes. And then again, jobs with hundreds of steps in parallel as well are not really, uh, sh shouldn't be used. Like this example on the right is really to avoid with ampersand at the end of an S run that will keep running multiple S runs in the same, um, in, in the same um, script. So just use uh, dependencies instead or, or greasy for multiple, uh, for, for packing better your, your simulation. And what not to do on login nodes. So you, you can use little commands, but please use the dash U option to check only your user jobs. Otherwise, you will overload the, the scheduler if you submit like uh, multiple times in sequence, even with the script, the SQ command, or even if you use watch that periodically checks the SQ. Another tool provided by the Slum scheduler is a SACT that gives you some accounting information. Again, not please do not run it with watch. If you compile an application and you use parallel make, use the dash J option, but please limit the number of parallel threads for instance, dash J8, avoid infinite loops. So this is absolutely uh, a bad idea to, to, to run with infinite loops. And also please make sure that if you have some variables in your script, then you need to check the script before and avoid the use of variables as limits of your loops. And last but not least, you have a specific option in the Sloom script that is mail user. It will inform you about the status of your job by mail. So you won't have to log in on the system every time and type SQ or uh, other Sloom commands to, to check that. In summary, the basic information the, to bring home are move your input data to Scratch, run on Scratch your jobs, use the, S the job script generator to generate your Sloom script and submit with SBatch to run on compute nodes. And if you want to monitor manually, use sq-u dollar user. While notification by mail are much more convenient in general. <clears throat> Last but not least, copy your output data back to project or home because Scratch is not backed up. So final part of the webinar, and then we will give you space for questions, is documentation and troubleshooting. So what should you do in case of trouble? Now, the main point of contact for uh, for us now is the CSCS service desk at support.cscs.ch. The service desk provides on the main page three basic links, knowledge base, user portal, and tutorials. These are the main source of information that we provide to users. Additional information is provided on the system with the module help, with the man command, or online at the HP support center. So the user documentation on the system to give you an idea 
you can type module help for instance program tray you will see the screenshot on the right side and you can go on and on and on looking for the different components of the program tray looking for information on the system for instance module help cc will give information on the cc on the Cray compiler you can additionally search for Cray cc for the uh, c compiler or if you load the module to that toolkit you can also type nvcc help which provide information on the nvidia compiler now you have also other documentation so for instance i mentioned the man page of pages of Cray, but I mentioned the HP Super Center at support.hp.com. You have the Cray books, both in HTML and PDF formats, and you have also the NVIDIA documentation portal, docs.nvidia.com. If, if nothing helps, let's say, if you can find a solution after searching the user portal, the knowledge-based tutorial pages and documentation on the systems, then you can contact us. So you should log in with your credentials on the CSCF service desk, and you choose a request type. Now, in the request type, you will be, you will see some uh, uh, fields to fill in, like the system and the project ID. You can report the Slurm job ID, please, and also the Slurm job script in case this is a problem related to your Slurm submission. You can also attach files like scripts, source files, or give us access, for instance, on the system if you have the files already on the system, of course. Please keep in mind that the more detailed your request and the more effective will be the reply. To give you a feeling of what it is the CSS desk with request types, after login, you will see scrolling down on the page of the service desk, this uh, page with, the, uh, with these nine types of requests. So you should select the request type that is best matching your question. You have a small explanation of the request type, accounting, cloud, connection for problems, using authentication, system and job scheduling for problems with bad jobs and so on and so forth. So include all relevant information in order to help us address your issue. Remember that summary description and project are mandatory fields and the system is mandatory for some types only. If you can find a matching type, you have the other request type that is available. An example of how to submit a request for support, so a template that you can adapt. The summary could be Slurm job failed on pit client, and you report your project ID. That could be also reported in a separate field. And in the description, you can write uh, that what is your username, what is the script that you submitted, what is the, the output of the job and the code, the status of the job. You can provide the paths to, the, to your job script. Please remember to make this, the, the paths accessible with a common CH mod. And then you can submit. Now, after you submit a request, you can monitor your request because if you scroll down after you're logging on the CCS service desk, you will see the section My Cases that you can filter for open requests, past requests created by you or others, if others have involved you as well. You can check the status of this request. In the example that I show, you see on the right side that the request is in progress and you can review the messages that have been exchanged in the request. So if you select a specific case, as in the example here in the screen, you can also share with other users this request. You see in the menu on the right side, you have the shared link. You can resolve the case if you think that it has been solved and there is nothing left for, uh, for you to, to as an issue. Or you can cancel the request if it was submitted by mistake. So I hand here the, I hand here the presentation with the useful links to postcscs.ch in the portal and I leave some space for questions.